Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Firewalls Don't Stop Dragons. I'm your host, Kerry Parker, and today we have episode 258 for February 7th, 2022. Uh, we got a news show for you today. I got lots of topics to cover. And one real quick note before we get into that, I was going to maybe read from some of this, but honestly, it's just better as a reference. Apple has put out what they're calling a personal safety guide uh, that I just want to direct you to. It's really cool. It's got some good information in it. It's definitely geared toward Apple devices, but uh, it's got some good general advice in there as well. Uh, I've added it to my resources page on my website, firewallsdon'tstopdragons.com. There's also a link in the show notes, but it's got some interesting stuff in there. You might want to check that out. But as I said, we've got a news show for you today. We're going to talk about how Google and Android has finally put in a kill switch for 2G Cellular, and I'll explain why that's such a big deal. I've got some more AirTags news. They just keep coming up. It's a popular it's a popular thing to pile on. So I wanted to mention a couple interesting AirTag stories. There was some kind of big news for Facebook this week. They've lost daily users for the first time ever, and they're claiming that they've lost billions of dollars because Apple has actually given users the ability to say, I don't want to be tracked. So we're going to talk a little bit about that news. There was a really, really big win for people who live in the EU. Uh, it's something that we talked about on this show with Johnny Ryan uh, last year, uh, and it's a really big victory. So uh, I'll catch you up to date with what happened there. There's been a kerfuffle over the IRS, the Internal Revenue Service here in the United States, uh, for acquiring people starting later this year, supposedly, to use facial ID tracking to log into their accounts which, as you might guess, has some uh, some problems associated with that. They have since maybe said they're walking that back anyway. I'll, we'll talk about that today. There was also an interesting report about how the FBI had bought a copy of the NSO Group's Pegasus software for evaluation. Apparently, they are claiming they didn't use it, um, but it's still rather troubling. Uh, so I'll tell you what we found out there. Then I've got a kind of disturbing article about the security or lack thereof in medical products, wearables and things like that. You know, obviously extremely sensitive data, but a recent study showing that a lot of these devices have horrible security. And then finally, Google says it has abandoned its flock technology in favor of something they're calling topics, um, which actually looks kind of promising. So uh, I'll talk a little bit about that. But my tip of the week or tips of the week it's going to be about de-googling your life. This was uh, something that I have committed to doing myself this year as part of my New Year's resolutions for 2022, something I also recommended that you guys do and have been recommending for years. So today in part one of that, we're going to talk about you know Google Search, Google Chrome, and Android. So today I'm going to have kind of my first installment of that. Well, I'll spread these out. I'm not sure how often I'll do them, but I'll, it'll be kind of an ongoing series as I work through this because there are many, many Google products. Uh, to to extract yourself from. Uh, but today we're going to start off with uh, Google Chrome, Google Search, and Android. So that's the news. And then after the news, please stay tuned. I, I've got the results from the annual listener survey, and there's been some interesting stuff there that I want to relay to you, including things that I've already been doing. I've made immediate use of the feedback. So uh, I wanted to let you know that these things do matter, and I do take them seriously. And uh, there's some interesting information that I got from that. So stay tuned after the news segment, and I'll tell you what I learned there. But now, let's get to the news. All right, first up, this is an article from Ars Technica, uh, and it's about Android finally allowing us to disable the old, old, insecure 2G cellular radios in our phones, uh, at least in Android phones, and not all Android phones because <laughs> it's Android. Uh, but let me read uh, this excerpt from this Ars Technica article. It says, The Electronic Frontier Foundation is celebrating Google's addition of a 2G kill switch to Android 12. The digital rights group has been campaigning against the dated, insecure 2G cellular standard since 2020, and Android is the first mobile U.S. to take the group's advice and lets users completely disable 2G. In the U.S., carriers shut down 2G years ago, and 3G shutdown is already underway. Phones have not really gotten the message, though, and modems still try to connect to nearby 2G signals automatically. The problem is that 2G is very old, and it's a lot like connecting to a WEP, or WEP, secured Wi-Fi hotspot. The security is obsolete, and so it's easy to crack. 
If you're in a country where legitimate uses of 2G are long dead, the standard only serves as an attack vector via fake cell phone towers, so why not just shut it off? The EFF explains the issues, and this is a quote from the EFF. It says, There are two main problems with 2G. First, it uses weak encryption between the tower and the device that can be cracked in real time by an attacker to intercept calls or text messages. In fact, the attacker can do this passively without ever transmitting a single packet. The second problem with 2G is that there's no authentication of the tower to the phone, which means that anyone can seamlessly impersonate a real 2G tower and a phone using the 2G protocol will never be the wiser. And back to the article from Ars Technica, it says, This isn't to say that non-2G signals are quote-unquote secure. They are less insecure, and you still shouldn't trust the cellular network. The best practice is to encrypt everything. This is generally the default for web communications, but depending on how your character and phone are set up, carrier services like SMS and phone calls could be more vulnerable. This 2G kill switch is a new feature in Android 12, but which phones are actually getting it? As usual with Android, the answer is complicated, and the switch is not coming to all Android 12 phones. Your best bet for getting a 2G kill switch is buying a new Android phone launching with Android 12, not a phone that is being upgraded to Android 12. The only way to really know if killing 2G is supported on your device is, op is to open the settings and look. If you want to kill 2G and have a normal settings layout, the switch is at Settings, Network and Internet, SIMS, that's S-I-M-S, Allow 2G. If your OEM scrambled the Android settings for the purpose of differentiation, try searching for 2G or hunting around the cellular settings. With Android taken care of, the EFF is now focusing on Apple. It's leading a Twitter campaign with a one-click tweet button reading, Hey Apple, 2G is outdated and insecure technology. Google just gave us the option to turn it off on our phones, and now it's your turn. So yeah, if you want to participate in that Twitter campaign, uh, go in the show notes. You'll find a link that'll launch that little automatic tweet. I've already done it. And yeah, eh, come on, Apple. <laughs> this should have been done a long time ago. Especially with them, they've got way more control over the devices than uh, most Android phones do. So yeah, let's hope that they follow suit soon. Next up, a couple stories about AirTags. These keep coming up. And again, these are wonderful little technological devices about the size of a quarter. Uh, with a little battery in it. You can slip it on anything and make sure you track it wherever it goes. You can use it for your laptop. You can use it for your purse. You can use it for your luggage, whatever. And they work really well, almost too well, because stalkers have been using these to track people, not just things. You know, any technology could be used for good or for ill, but <laughs> there are still people that take these things and take it to the next level. And so here's a, uh, a very short article from Mac Rumors. Actually, it's a longer article. I just cut out the first couple paragraphs, which gets the point across, and then I want to make a couple other points. So anyway, from Mac Rumors, just briefly, it says... Apple AirTag tracking devices with deactivated speakers have been spotted on eBay and Etsy, raising privacy concerns about the risks of removing one of the AirTag's safeguards, PC Mag reports. The modified AirTags, dubbed silent AirTags, have had their internal speaker removed so that they are no longer able to emit a sound to highlight their presence. The silent AirTag looks identical to a normal AirTag, other than a small hole cut below the device's battery to disconnect the speaker. All right, I, it goes on. I'm not going to bother, but you get the idea. Someone took an Apple AirTag and figured out the exact right place to drill a little hole that will kill the speaker in the thing. And again, what happens is Apple put in this anti-stalking technology, basically, which says that if an AirTag is left alone away from its owner for a certain amount of time, it will start to beep like, hey, I don't know where my owner is, but you might want to know that... <laughs> that somebody stuck an air tag on you or whatever or somebody left an air tag near you it doesn't necessarily mean it's malicious but it has been used that way and that was what the purpose of the feature is for and somebody some enterprising people were selling these things for like 80 bucks on eBay and Etsy where they took an air tag which cost 30 bucks and disabled the speaker so that that wouldn't happen it would not alert the user okay so now if you have an Apple device like an Apple iPhone it will still warn you that there's an Apple device near you that's not yours, and it's been there for a while. So if you have an Apple device, it does that. Now, Android devices were kind of left out of this for a while, but Apple created an app 
that will let you do that with Android devices as well. It doesn't work as well. Like for instance, you actually have to be running the app. It doesn't just work in the background, which so that's kind of sucky. But I mean, if you want, you could bring this app up and find out if there's an AirTag on you somewhere or near you that's not yours. Probably isn't since you've got <laughs> since you don't have an iPhone. There are other apps, I guess, that do this too that might be better. But you know, that's again, this is just technology uh, that people are finding a way to abuse. Now, you should know that there are plenty of other ways to do this. Not only are there other similar tracking devices like those from Tile, you can right now go on Amazon and buy a waterproof, battery-powered, magnetic GPS tracking device that you can put on the fender of somebody's car uh, or slip into their on their person somewhere, and it will give the exact GPS location of that person. There are plenty of ways to stalk people. This is not new. But, you know, Apple being Apple and journalists wanting to get people to read their articles, you know, it's very easy to pick on here. I, again, it's not like these things are can't be abused. Of course, they could be abused. Uh, and we have to be careful of that. And I give Apple a lot of credit for trying to bend over backwards to try to make sure that their devices won't be abused. But they can still be abused. They can also be used for good. I read a couple other articles lately. There was one lady who was hiring a moving company. She was military or something, and they were moving across the country, as military people do often. And she's had enough moving experience to know that she didn't always trust her movers. So she slipped an air tag into one of the boxes. And, uh, you know, the movers said they were going to be there by a certain date, and then they weren't. Uh, and they said, sorry, you know, sorry, we're running late. Now we're going to be there by this later date. And at one point they said, okay, well, well, we're here's where we are. Here's where your stuff is now. And this is why it's going to take us longer to get to you. Except that they were lying. And she knew they were lying because she was able to pull up the location of that air tag. And she said, look, I, I know where the stuff is and it's not where you just told me it was, you know, so there's an instance where somebody creatively used an air tag for their own personal benefit. There was someone else in Europe, apparently, who some journalist who used one to try to find the location of a secret government site, a site that the government claimed didn't exist, but they found a way to put a tag on something. I think they just mailed a package to someplace with an air tag in it and assumed or hoped that package would go to the secret site. And apparently it did. And it showed up in a place that was not supposed to be a government site, but it was sent to a government address. And, you know, so, so it, it, yeah, it opens up some interesting possibilities and you need to be aware of those possibilities, but it's technology and technology can always be used for good or for ill. All right, next up. And this is, this brings up a little schadenfreude, I must say. Uh, a couple articles here, uh, one from The Verge, uh, one from The New York Times. The first one talks about how, for the very first time ever in Facebook's history, now called Meta, they have lost daily active users. So let me read briefly from this article from The Verge. Since its inception, Facebook's user growth has essentially been up and to the right. In other words, if you're looking at a graph, it's just going up. But on Wednesday, and this was last Wednesday by the time you probably hear this, it reported its first ever quarterly decline of daily users globally, along with lower than expected ad growth that sent its stock plunging roughly 20%. This massive stock drop, which instantly wiped out roughly $200 billion in market value, shows that Facebook's corporate rebrand to Meta isn't enough to distract investors from the problems in its core business of social media. Not only was user growth across Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp essentially flat last quarter, but the main Facebook app lost 1 million daily users in North America, where it makes the most money through advertising. That drop led to an overall decrease in daily users of Facebook globally, which the company's spokesperson confirmed is the first sequential decline in the company's history. That drop to 1.929 billion daily users from 1.93 billion the prior quarter is likely a reflection of Facebook's increasing lack of relevance with young people. Meta doesn't break out Instagram's user numbers, but daily users across all of its apps barely nudged higher to 2.82, adding just 10 million users from the third quarter. Meta is still wildly profitable. It made nearly $40 billion in profit last year alone, mostly from advertising. 
All right, I'll just go right into this next article from the New York Times. It says, Apple's vision of a more private web is not necessarily a more profitable one for the Internet companies that depend on advertising revenue. That lesson was clear on Wednesday in an earnings report from Meta, the company that Mark Zuckerberg founded as Facebook. Meta said that privacy features introduced by Apple last year could cost Mr. Zuckerberg's company $10 billion in lost sales this year. The news, along with increased spending as Meta tries to focus on the new idea of the metaverse, dropped Meta's stock price more than 26% on Thursday morning. Mr. Zuckerberg said Wednesday that Apple's changes and new privacy regulations in Europe represented, quote, a clear trend where less data is available to deliver personalized ads, unquote. Apple made significant changes to the privacy settings of its mobile operating system last year, allowing iPhone users to choose whether advertisers could track them. Since Apple introduced the feature, a vast majority of iPhone users have opted to block tracking. Only 24% of iPhone users around the world have consented to being tracked by advertisers, according to data published in December by the analytics company Flurry. That means that a broad swath of iPhone users are evading the personal tracking preferred by advertisers. Yeah, okay, so <laughs> let me break out you know, the world's tiniest violin uh, for Facebook here. You know, I'll be talking about this more in a minute when we talk about Google's flock. But again, the problem is not advertising. Advertising is fine. It's the tracking and the, the abuse of personal data that's the problem here. And Facebook and Google and so many others and data brokers have just abused our data and our trust. Now, again, like the article says, there, I'm not sure that's the reason why Facebook is losing or not gaining customers. Uh, I definitely think it is something more for older generation and the younger generation just not really that into it, which is, of course, why Facebook is trying to buy some of these other companies that do appeal to younger kids. But anyway, maybe, just maybe, Mark Zuckerberg, who completely controls Facebook and Meta and all these companies that they own, since he has a controlling stake at the company, you know, maybe he'll finally wake up and decide that he can make money on advertising without doing all the tracking. All right, next up, uh, this is an article from Engadget, and it's about uh, a really big win for folks that are in the EU uh, in terms of privacy uh, and connected to a really great interview we did last year with Johnny Ryan from the Irish Council for Civil Liberties. Uh, okay, so let me just read the article, and we'll talk about it. After a years-long process, data protection officials across the European Union have ruled that Europe's ad tech industry has been operating unlawfully. The decision, handed down by Belgium's Data Protection Authority and agreed by regulators across the EU, found that the system underpinning the industry violated a number of principles of the General Data Protection Regulations, or GDPR. The Irish Council for Civil Liberties has declared victory in its protracted battle against the authority which administers much of the advertising industry on the continent, the IAB Europe. Internet Advertising Bureau, I think is what IAB stands for. At the heart of this story is the use of the Transparency and Consent Framework, or TCF, a standardized process to enable publishers to sell ad space on their websites. This framework, set by IAB Europe, is meant to provide legal cover in the form of those consent pop-ups which blight websites, enabling a silent digital auction system known as Real-Time Bidding, or RTB. But both the nature of the consent given when you click a pop-up and the data collected as part of the RTB process have now been deemed to violate the GDPR, which governs privacy rights in the block. Ad tech companies working across a number of different platforms can collect real data about you, marry that to your browsing habits, and create a detailed portrait of your life. Dr. Johnny Ryan, who led the legal campaign on behalf of the ICCL, called this the world's biggest data breach. Since this data is broadcast online to a wide number of recipients without direct oversight, the APD has ruled that any and all data collected as part of this real time bidding process must now be deleted. This could have fairly substantial implications for many big tech companies with their own ad businesses, such as Google and Facebook, as well as big data companies. Regulators have also handed down an initial fine of €250,000 to the IAB Europe and ordered the body to effectively rebuild the ad tech framework it currently uses. This includes making the system GDPR compliant, if such a thing is possible, and appoint a dedicated data protection officer. All right, so that sounded like a little bit of legal mumbo jumbo, but... Uh, as we talked with Dr. Ryan last year about this process, real-time bidding is this 
thing where behind the scenes, whenever you go to a website, all the ad spaces on that page, it's kind of like billboards as you drive down the highway. Those things are rented out. Uh, some advertising company owns the billboards and they rent space on those for a certain amount of time, for a certain amount of money for people who want to advertise there. And they try to say, well, you know, people that go down this highway are this sort of demographics and this is how many people go down there every day and your ad's going to be seen by this many people. It's the same thing for a website. They try to figure out what the demographics are of the website. And of course, they do this by massive tracking, you know, way more than you could do with a billboard on a highway. And then behind the scenes in milliseconds, you know, as this somebody goes to a web page and those ad spaces are getting ready to be filled, they have this process called real-time bidding where they everything they know about that person using that web browser, going to that website, which could be substantial, is quickly farmed out to potentially thousands of customers who want to place an ad on one of those little billboard spaces and says, okay, here's who I got. Here's what, everything I know about this person. Uh, if you want to show an ad to this person who might be white, middle-aged, makes this amount of money, is uh, heterosexual, Christian, likes cars, you know, has a gambling problem, has these medical conditions, and so on and so forth. You know, hey, this, this, is, this is who I got. You know, now bid. Let's start the bidding. And again, this is all automated done by computers in the background. And basically what, you know, the ICCL and Johnny Ryan are basically saying is, look, you can't, (laughs) this is totally violating people's privacy and no, you know, cookie banner pop-up thing that comes up and says, accept, you know, all cookies or whatever could possibly come close to getting consent uh, and informing people of what's really going on here. And they won. So this is, this is a really big deal. Of course, like probably any court case, this will probably be appealed, you know, and it may get stuck in courts for a while longer, but this is a big, big win. Uh, but anyway, so I don't want to call that out. And uh, congratulations to uh, the ICCL and Dr. Ryan for their tireless work on this. They this they seem to have won this battle anyway. Okay, next up, uh, this is an article from Bloomberg, and it's about the IRS using facial recognition, uh, requiring it uh, to log into your IRS account. The Treasury Department is reconsidering the Internal Revenue Service's reliance on facial recognition software ID.me, that's a company, ID.me, for access to its website, an official set on Friday amid scrutiny of the company's collection of images of tens of millions of Americans' faces. The Treasury and the IRS are looking for alternatives to ID.me, a department official said. The company has faced growing criticism over its software and its use of facial recognition technology. And this is a quote from an IRS spokeswoman, uh, Alexandra Lamana, Lamana, and she says, quote, the IRS is consistently looking for ways to make the filing process more secure, end quote. The IRS had previously announced that any taxpayer looking to access an online account on irs.gov will be required to be verified through IDME in a process that requires taking a selfie. Lamana noted that any taxpayer who does not want to use IDME can opt against filing his or her taxes online. Yeah, great choice. And this is another quote from her, I believe. It says, quote, We believe in the importance of protecting the privacy of taxpayers while also ensuring criminals are not able to gain access to taxpayer accounts, unquote. And then she goes on to argue that basically it's impossible for the IRS to develop its own cutting-edge identification program because of, quote, the lack of funding for IRS modernization, unquote. Without its own in-house system, the agency turned to third-party companies, including IDME, which she noted is compliant with the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST, and is used by multiple federal agencies. IDME, which has faced criticism for its work on behalf of state unemployment systems during the pandemic, has previously deflected questions about its use of facial recognition technology by saying it only uses so-called one-to-one technology. That process compares a selfie taken by a user to their likeness on a driver's license or passport. The company disclosed this week, which is last week for you, that it actually also used much more controversial one-to-many technology to compare selfies to a bigger database of images that it collected. Critics have also raised concern about the third-party company's access to facial images, but the Treasury official stressed that the IRS protects any data it receives and that the law protects taxpayer information from disclosure to other parties. Okay, so a couple things real quick. First of all, this is tax season here in the United States. So that's when tax scams really get going. So just be extra careful and be more diligent. And, you know, when you get messages out of the blue with tax information or something that purports to be from the tax agency saying that you've got a problem, you need to click here to fix that or call this number to fix that. Be very wary and do not give out information unless you know exactly who you're talking to. 
Also, if you have not already done so, you should plant your flag. And by that, I mean, if you have not already created a personal logon for your IRS account online, also for your social security account online, because they're different, or really any important government-based account where you might need an online account, please go ahead and get that set up. Even if you don't plan to use it, claim it. You know, put a really good password on it, set up two-factor authentication if you can. This is not just a U.S. thing. This is a worldwide thing. You know, any important account that might be government-related where, you know, if you can interact with it online in any way, make sure that you're the one who gets in there and creates the account for yourself and not somebody else. Basically, it's a way to prevent identity theft. Now, back to this article in particular. So I get what they're doing. They're trying to make it more secure for people to log in, but facial recognition stuff is is tricky. And I, I even read somewhere else about this technology that IDMe not just requires you to upload a selfie. And I guess what they're doing is because it's a government related thing and ID, IDMe is not, they're contracting with the government. So that probably means they're getting access to governmental databases like your passport photo or your DMV photo. So they can say, okay, hey, I got someone here who says he's Kerry Parker. He's uploaded his selfie. Uh, show me his passport picture so I can compare those two and make sure that that's really him. So now these third parties are potentially getting access to government databases. And yeah, I'm sure there are laws around them not abusing that data, but that's just one more entity that has access to your data and they could screw up. They could have bad security. They could have a rogue employee. You know, it's just one more way for your information to get loose. And as we all know, facial recognition technology has problems. It has biases. And like any sort of biometric scanning feature, it's a really dangerous thing to traffic in because if that did, it gets loose, you can't it, you can't change it. It's not like a password. Oh, someone guessed my password. I guess I better pick a new one. You can't you can't change your face, or your eye print, or your fingerprint, or your DNA. Using biometrics for authentication has real problems. So anyway, kind of glad that they got a bunch of pushback on this, and they're maybe reevaluating uh, the need for this sort of authentication. Okay, next up, this is an article from the Washington Post, and it's about how the FBI apparently was evaluating the NSO group's nasty, nasty phone spyware. Uh, so from the article, it says, the FBI tested Pegasus spyware made by the Israeli company NSO group for possible use in criminal investigations, even as the FBI and Justice Department were investigating whether the NSO software had been used to illegally hack phones in the United States. People familiar with the events have told the Washington Post. Justice Department lawyers at the time discussed that if the FBI were actually to deploy the tool, it could complicate any subsequent prosecution if the department brought charges, according to the people who spoke on the condition of anonymity because of the matter's sensitivity. In a statement to the Post, the FBI confirmed that it had tested the spyware but stressed it had not been used, quote, in support of any investigation, unquote. The FBI statement is the first official confirmation that a U.S. law enforcement agency has tested NSO spyware. The development was first reported by the New York Times. This is a quote from the statement from the FBI. It says, quote, The FBI works diligently to stay abreast of emerging technologies and tradecraft, not just to explore a potential legal use, but also to combat crime and to protect both American people and our civil liberties. That means we routinely identify, evaluate, and test technical solutions and problems for a variety of reasons, including, including possible operational and security concerns they might pose in the wrong hands. There was no operational use in support of any investigation. The FBI procured a limited license for the product testing and evaluation only, unquote. Pegasus is NSO's most well-known spyware, breathtakingly potent in its ability to covertly scoop up an iPhone or Android phone user's calls and text messages, pictures, and whereabouts. NSO says it's for use only against bad actors such as gangsters and drug lords, but investigations by civil society groups have uncovered its use by foreign governments to track activists, journalists, lawyers, and their families. The Israeli firm has repeatedly said Pegasus cannot be used to target U.S. phones or devices assigned to a plus one U.S. number. But NSO appears to have created a workaround, a separate product called Phantom, to enable American law enforcement to monitor U.S. devices, according to the documents obtained by the tech news site Motherboard in 2020. According to the Times, NSO Group made a presentation on Phantom's capability to the FBI in 2019 to show that the spyware, quote, could hack any number in the United States that the FBI decided to target, unquote. 
According to the Times, the FBI decided not to deploy the spyware last summer, around the time the Post and at an international journalism consortium published a multi-part investigation that found Pegasus had been used to attack the phones of journalists, human rights activists, and politicians around the world. The company has promised to investigate abuses of its systems and cut off clients who violate NSO rules. Yeah, okay, so <laughs> I've talked about these guys a lot. I think it's pretty obvious what I think about them and what they're doing. Uh, this stuff should just be outlawed. Um, I don't understand how this stuff can really happen. Now, obviously, you know, intelligence agencies are going to have programs that develop things like this, but that there shouldn't be an open market for these things on the, with, from private companies. It's, that should just not be allowed. And NSO Group in particular seems to be pretty slimy. All right, let's move on. Uh, this is an article from Threat Post. It's about medical wearables with horrible security. And it says, Telehealth care is on the rise as medical service providers cope with the strain of a pandemic and rising costs. But the rush to roll out remote health care has also unleashed a universe of wearable medical devices to collect sensitive data, which researchers say are widely vulnerable to attack. Analysts with Kaspersky Labs reported finding 33 vulnerabilities last year in the most widely used data transfer protocol for Internet of Things medical devices, known as MQQT. That's 10 more than the previous year. All of them put patient data at risk, the team warned. To put those numbers in perspective, the analysts at Kaspersky said only 90 vulnerabilities in MQTT have been reported since 2014. Worse yet, many of those bugs are still unpatched, they added. So basically 90 vulnerabilities since 2014, 33 of them in the last year. It's getting worse. MQTT's convenience makes it a common solution in most IoT gadgets, including medical devices. But as the Kaspersky researchers point out, authentication isn't required and encryption is sparse, making devices with MQTT exposed to man-in-the-middle attacks and data theft. Besides just the device, Kaspersky reported finding concerning flaws in the most common wearable device platform, Qualcomm Snapdragon Wearable. Qualcomm's a company, Snapdragon is a particular processor they make, and wearable apparently is a version for IoT devices. The platform has been riddled with bugs, the team added, bringing the total number of vulnerabilities found in the platform since it was launched in 2020 to 400, many still unpatched. This makes for an enormous vulnerable attack surface across the healthcare sector, while attacks are getting more frequent, brazen, and destructive. It's up to hospitals and medical service providers to build telehealth systems with security in mind, Nate Warfield, CTO of Prevalian, uh, wrote in Threat Post last summer. He called on the private sector to lend a hand to shore up the critical health care infrastructure. And this is a quote from him. He says, quote, Hospitals need to take more aggressive action to fortify themselves against these attacks. They also need to increase their investments in cybersecurity. Advanced defensive tools need to be more accessible to the healthcare sector. Information sharing across organizations must be encouraged, and collaboration across all sectors to help defend these life-saving industries should be the norm, not the exception, unquote. Kaspersky recommended the obvious security factors of using strong passwords and having good user security training, but added that application developers need to do more. So yeah, in this case, really the onus is on the device manufacturers and the people that write the software for those devices. And what this is calling out is that they're doing a pretty bad job. Now, we have in the United States, we've got you know laws like HIPAA that try to protect user data, but it doesn't really apply here. And so, again, unfortunately, this is probably an area where we're just going to need some regulation. You know, there has to be consequences, uh, you know, for people who create insecure medical devices. I mean, it could, you know, be a life-threatening thing. What if someone were able to hack your pacemaker or someone was able to hack your insulin pump? So, anyway, something to be aware of. Obviously, if you're in a position where you need one of these devices, you may not have a choice. It's not like you can go shopping and, you know, I want the more secure version of this you know, you're going to get what you get. So, and so in this case, we just need to push for, you know, some more regulations to make this stuff better. All right, one more article here, and this will kind of lead neatly into uh, my tips of the week. Uh, and this is from The Verge. And this is about Google's latest foray into updating its advertising networks to be less privacy invasive. And honestly, it looks good. Like 
weirdly good. <laughs> like I, I, I don't know what to make of this yet. And I'm sure we'll be talking about this more. Uh, but let me just read this article, then I'll say more. Google is walking back plans to replace third-party cookies with Flock. And if you recall, that's that's an acronym, a retronym, because they had these weird bird-themed things, so Flock. Uh, Federated Learning of Cohorts is what Flock stands for. So they're trying to replace Flock by instead proposing the Topics API, a new system for interest-based advertising. Topics works by pinpointing five of your interests, such as fitness or travel and transportation, based on your web activity as measured by participating sites for one week. Your browser will store these topics for three weeks before deleting them. Google says that these categories, quote, are selected entirely on your device, unquote, and don't involve, quote, any external servers, including Google, including Google servers, unquote. When you visit a website, topics will show the site and its advertising partners just three of your interests, consisting of, quote, one topic from each of the past three weeks, unquote. As noted on the Topics API GitHub page, and there's a link to that in the article if you care to read it and click on it, there are currently about 350 available topics in its advertising taxonomy, although Google plans on adding anywhere from a few hundred to a few thousand eventually. Google says topics won't include any quote-unquote sensitive categories like race or gender. And if you're using Chrome, the company is building tools to let you view and delete topics as well as turn off the feature. Google's previous replacement of third-party cookies, Flock, or Federated Learning of Cohorts, is a form of interest-based tracking that identifies you based on your cohort or a group of people that share similar interests. Privacy critics like the Electronic Frontier Foundation argued the system poses additional privacy risks, such as making it easier for identifiers to identify you with browser fingerprinting, a tool used by sites to gain specific information about your device and browser, and may also expose information about your demographics, potentially resulting in discriminatory targeted ads. Due to these concerns, browsers like Brave, Vivaldi, Edge, and Mozilla have all refused to use it. And this is a quote from Bennett Cyphers, who we've had on the show a couple times. He says, quote, it definitely improves on Flock in some important ways, but less scary than Flock doesn't mean that it's good. It will tell third-party trackers about what kind of sites you browse, and it could help websites and advertisers ID you across devices, unquote. Now, I've done some research into this, and it's the way it's specced out now, and I completely understand that this could change and morph over time, which is always worrisome. But the way it's spelled out now is actually kind of looks like a decent compromise. It's surprising, actually, how little information it gives up about you. And the other thing I really don't understand is if this is adopted, it just seems to be giving away the golden goose. I, I don't understand how Google independently profits from this. I, I mean, I guess they're still the advertiser, but this information is available directly, I think, to any website you visit, I, I guess I'd have to look into those technical details. Maybe Google still somehow completely controls the dissemination of this information, but I, I don't know how, because it's all in the browser. Like this information is only kept on your browser and is not, according to this, is not given up directly to Google. So anyway, we're going to talk about this more in the future. It It's interesting. It, it's very interesting and we'll have to keep an eye on it. It's way better than Flock was. Uh, they seem to have completely thrown that out. And, you know, kudos to Google. They have listened to all of this feedback and come up with a new solution that might work. It's it's a step above, you know, straight up contextual advertising where you have to enter something on a site like at a search engine where you're you're saying, I'm looking for, you know, new sneakers. And so it might show you ads from sneaker makers. As you go around the web you know, for participating websites, they can mark you into certain categories. And I looked at the categories. They're very mundane. They're very almost boring. Uh, they really they don't say much about you, you know, like arts and entertainment. You know, I'm interested in going to concerts, you know, not even, you know, necessarily what kinds of concert, like country music or whatever. It, it just seems to be pretty darn generic. And it, I don't know. We'll, we'll see. The devil's always going to be in the details. And, uh, you know, these things always can morph into something much, much worse. But I, you know, hats off for Google to Google for even trying. I think this potentially has some promise. It'll be interesting to see where this goes. Another thing that's interesting about this is it's got full transparency. So apparently the way this will be set up is I, as a user at any point, can see exactly 
you know, what these very few high level topics are about me that are being given away. By the way, they've also got these really interesting controls a bit about who can see this data. It's not even just, you know, all these advertisers can see it. It's very specific. Like I needed to have interacted with one of these guys before. They even throw in some randomness to this. Like there's a 5% chance uh, that a topic that will be given up about me will just be a random one. It has nothing to do with me personally. Just throw some noise into the system. It's interesting. They've thought about a lot of stuff uh, in here and tried to preserve privacy and minimize how much you can learn about somebody. And again, they've, you know, they've so far at least, you know, said they're not going to have any topics that are about controversial things about you, you know, your sexuality, your religion, your uh, hopefully income and things like that. It just won't even be in this thing. So anyway, it, that's interesting. Now, of course, <laughs> for for this to work, you know, all these advertisers would have to just use this. And given, you know, how data hungry they are and how they've gotten used to the much, much more juicy information that they have today, you know, the other problem with this is nobody may want it. <laughs> no one may adopt it and they may try to stick to what they're doing now and just use their own methods instead of Google's uh, to find out about you. So, you know, there's a lot of caveats to this, but certainly at least from a conceptual level, I think it's interesting. So we'll see what comes of this. But that still leads me to my tips of the week. And uh, what I mentioned in, in the New Year's show is that one of my resolutions for this year is to try to minimize my Google footprint, to de-Google my life to the best uh, I can. And I, be, uh, while I could get rid of it probably 100% personally if I really tried, uh, it's actually really hard to avoid Google. Uh, you know, Google Analytics and things that are things that I didn't even choose are happening all the time anyway. Uh, I think it was Kara Swisher or somebody did a really interesting article where for like six weeks or so, she tried to completely avoid anything remotely related to Google and how very, very difficult that was. If you, uh, if you go to my privacy checklist, I think there's a link to that article in there if you want to find that out. But there are a lot of interesting and privacy-respecting alternatives to Google that uh, I want to investigate and I want to bring you along with me. And so in part one of my de-Google My Life campaign, I'm going to focus on kind of three easy ones. And then I will do more uh, over time. I'm not sure how often I'll do these, but uh, I'll keep, you know, doing them here in, in my blog and newsletter. So I pick three things to start. Google Search, Google Chrome, the browser, and Android. So again, there's a whole blog article uh, right on my website if you want to go read this uh, and get to all the links I'm going to kind of talk about here. Uh, if you're a newsletter subscriber, you already got this last night. But let, let's start with these three because uh, they're, they're, they're kind of easy. First of all, Google search. Now, the easy thing is to pick, you know, when you're going to a search site to pick a different one. And I obviously have talked about DuckDuckGo many times. Uh, start page is another one. Um, there are actually now several of these. Uh, privacytools.io has got a really good list of these. Uh, but honestly, DuckDuckGo and StartPage are, are just fine. There's another interesting new one called you.com. That's Y-O-U.com. It, it certainly looks really nice, uh, but I don't know a whole lot about that one yet. But anyway, so, you know, if you're deciding what to search on, then you can go to one of those sites and they will respect your privacy. And in particular, I, like for instance, StartPage behind the scenes actually uses results from Google and they pay Google for this privilege. And to make money, they advertise, but they only do contextual advertising. So they only show you ads based on whatever search terms you just put in. And they don't share that with third parties. But the problem here is that with most people today don't really think about their search engine because it tends to be embedded in their web browser. So what used to just be the address bar where you would go and type in HTTP colon slash slash, you know, Amazon.com, that same space, that same little text box, you can also put in your search terms. They used to have a separate box for that, but most browsers have combined that into one little text box. Now, what you might not think about or realize is there is a search engine chosen for you behind the scenes by your web browser to search on whatever terms you put in that little address space. And by default, in a lot of cases, that is Google. And including with both Safari and Firefox, by the way. So... The real thing here is you want to pick your new search engine, be it DuckDuckGo or StartPage or whatever, uh, and then you need to change your default web browser's search engine. And you can do this on your mobile browsers as well. The, the process might be a little bit different. Uh, for your computers, the easiest way, honestly, is just to install 
the corresponding extension or add-on or plugin or whatever you want to call it for the web browser for DuckDuckGo or StartPage. They're both quite good. And by virtue of installing this plugin, it will change your default search engine to be them. All right, so that's search. Next up, browser. 63% of the planet uses Google Chrome as their, as their browser. It's an extremely, extremely popular browser. It's probably higher than that in the U.S., it's a decently secure browser. It's functionally, it's got great features, but for privacy, it's just horrible. I mean, you just have to assume that anything, anything you do in that browser is known to Google. I mean, I, I would just have to assume that whether you're signed into a Google account on that browser or not. And so I recommend, again, as you well know, uh, that you use Firefox instead. Now, if you're a Mac only person, Safari is actually pretty darn good too. Uh, so, you know, if you're comfortable with Safari and it does what you need it to do, uh, you know, you can just keep using Safari. Otherwise, I would highly recommend you look at Firefox. Now, if you are switching, if you're making the switch from Chrome to Firefox, there's one other thing that you need to do, and that is you might want to import or transfer some stuff, some data from your Chrome browser to your Firefox browser. So there's a link to this in my blog article that tells you how to do this, but there are ways for you to import and export, for you to transfer from Chrome to Firefox, all of your bookmarks, for example, your favorites, you know, all the websites that you've told it to remember. If you're like me, I've got dozens and dozens and dozens of them all organized in little folders, but you can easily transfer that from one to the other. There's a little facility for doing that. The other thing you might need to do if you're not already using a dedicated password manager, if you're using Chrome to save passwords and information, uh, I would recommend that instead of transferring that to Firefox, because Firefox will do that too, is that you instead use a dedicated password manager like LastPass or 1Password or Bitwarden. And all three of those have a mechanism by which you can export your passwords and website information from Chrome and import it into the password manager. Saves you a ton of time. So again, uh, I'm not going to walk you through those steps here, but if you go to the blog article, there are links that will show you how to do that. All right. And last up, Android. Now this is, this is simultaneously easy and difficult. It's easy to say, which is don't use Android. <laughs> Uh, the hard part is, of course, that you paid good money for your cell phone and your cell phone service, and just switching to a new phone is not cheap or easy. Now, the obvious simple answer, and maybe it's kind of a facile answer, but is to switch to iPhone or iOS. It is way more private than Android. But for a lot of people, it might not be private enough. And if you're going to make a switch and you're really thinking about, you know, your privacy, and that's one of the main reasons you want to switch, there are some other options you can consider. They're not for the faint of heart, <laughs> but there are options. In fact, you could use them on your existing Android phone, I think in certain cases. I'm not an Android person, so I'm, I, I don't want to make a blanket statement here, but there are two operating systems for uh, Android-based phones that you can get. One's called Lineage OS, and one's called Graphene OS. Graphene in particular is for Google, Google devices like Pixel phones. You can replace the stock Android that comes with your phone with one of these two Android-based operating systems. I think they're I think they're Android-based if they're at least Linux-based. That are and they're privacy-focused. Now I have not used them. I would have to guess that they're probably much more limited in terms of what you can do. I don't know if you have full access to the Google Play Store, for example. It will be a journey, and it's one that I have not taken, so I can't directly recommend it because I have not done it. But a lot of people have done it, and it's something that I don't want to fail to mention here. But the simplest way to go, um, if you want to make a switch, when, whenever your time comes to get a new cell phone, maybe, is to get an iPhone. Again, Apple's not perfect. I'm not trying to say they are, but from a privacy perspective, it's way better than Android. All right, so there you go. My first three tips in my de-Google Your Life series. Not sure when I'll do the next one. Uh, hopefully it won't be too long, but it'll probably handle um, Gmail next and maybe I'll throw in Gcal uh, uh, just for good measure. So there you go. There's your news and your tips of the week. A couple quick things I want to go over uh, before I let you go today. Uh, first of all, the listener survey results. First of all, thank you so much to everybody who replied. Uh, I did identify the winners and they have all been notified and have been sent their prizes, but I very much appreciate this. I want you to know that I read every single response. And so I want to kind of relate to you a few of the things, interesting things that I learned from those responses. First of all, <laughs> 
Yes, I know. I talk too fast. Uh, it is something I am acutely aware of, and yet it's just kind of built in, and it's something that I have a hard time dealing with. I'm making a conscious effort right now not to speak quickly, but I know that when I get riffing on something, when I start getting hot on some topic or get excited about something, I speak very quickly. So I get it. I know. I will. <laughs> I try. Uh, as I do this more and more as the years go by, I do, I think, get better, uh, but it takes conscious effort. So just bear with me. So next up, you may have already noticed today that I have lowered the volume of the transition music. I actually did this once a long time ago because I realized it was kind of loud by comparison to my voice, for example. But I got at least one comment that said it's still too loud. So I have lowered the volume again, uh, and hopefully it will be a little less jarring uh, during the transitions. Next up, I've got lots of great suggestions for topics to cover, some of which I have already made moves to do. Uh, for instance, open source software. Got a few people wanted to hear more about open source software, and it's a great topic. Uh, and in fact, I think that will be our interview for next week. So ask and ye shall receive. A lot of people, you know, mention there are things I talk about a lot anyway, you know, third party data collection, surveillance capitalism, identity theft. Uh, data breaches, you know, regular vulnerabilities in our everyday products. A lot of those things came up, which is great because I talk about those things a lot. So I'm glad to hear that I'm addressing those needs. A lot of people mentioned that they really like the practical advice. They like the news, but that what they really want is, okay, great. What does that mean for me? And again, that is something I try to make sure that I do, uh, but it's good to get that reinforcement from you guys that you enjoy that. And I will, you know, redouble my efforts to try to make sure that I bring home from every one of these articles, you know, so how it applies to you. And if there's anything in particular you can do as a result of that, or if it, or if it, you know, gives me any great ideas for things that you could be doing to improve your security or privacy, uh, I will certainly make a point of doing that. Another thing I want to bring up because some people told me how much they really enjoy this. And I don't think a lot of people look at this is the show notes. I include show notes with every single one of these. And you may have to go to your podcast app and kind of play around with each episode to kind of show those show notes, but they should be right there in your podcast app. Uh, or if you want, you can go you know, to my podcast website directly and they'll all be there. You can look at the old ones that way too. But not only does it give more information, you know, on the podcast and what I talked about and maybe the guest, but it's got links to all the articles that I talk about and anything I mention, I try to throw a link there in the show notes. So um, it's a really great resource. If you have not looked at the show notes, um, you know, make a point you know, this time to go and find them so you know how to access them. So when I say in the future, and there's a link in the show notes, uh, you know how to quickly find that. I'm doing a lot more bonus content now. Uh, this, is, of course, is just for my patrons. And usually what that has been lately is, you know, uh, I'll talk to my interview guests and I'll ask them some other question, usually kind of unrelated to the topic at hand. You know, it's something more personal for them or just some other interesting, you know, story from them. Uh, but I think what I'm also going to start doing now is doing some more kind of technically oriented stuff, you know, topics that I think might be over the head, uh, you know, maybe of the bulk of the audience, but I do know that there's some tech heads out there. There's some people out there with propeller beanies on, you know, like myself that, that, that want to go that next step and learn some more stuff. I am going to try to start doing some more bonus content around more technical topics. So again, that may, might be another reason uh, to become a patron uh, and you can just go to patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, uh, search for firewalls, those top dragons, and you'll get all the information there. Uh, several people mentioned Linux, which is the kind of the free open source version of the really old, like OG <laughs> operating system called Unix. And it's really cool. It's got a lot of great applications. It's actually used in probably every IoT device. Almost every device you buy today with a computer in it is almost certainly running some flavor of Linux operating system. And you can run Linux at home. You can get a computer, a regular laptop or a desktop computer, and you can install Linux on it. We're going to talk about that um, next week when we talk to Sean O'Brien. It's just, it's it's not as easy to use. And what that generally means, unless you want to create a dual boot scenario where you can actually boot two different operating systems on one computer, which is, you know, not for the faint of heart, then you're going to be getting rid of Windows and Mac OS or iOS and Android completely. Uh, in favor of Linux. And, you know, there are good things about those too. So I don't bring it up a lot. Just, you know, I personally use Linux all the time, uh, being a software developer and a tech person, you know, I'm deep into Linux personally. It's just, I find something that doesn't have a broad appeal to non-technical people. So I don't bring it up that often. 
But I have taken the note that some people have interested in it, and I will, you know, where I can, where it makes sense, uh, I will talk about open source software and Linux stuff more often uh, than I have been. As far as demographics, I did ask for a little bit of self-reported demographic information as far as age and country, and I thought you might be interested to know uh, that, you know, a lot of the, I, I'm listened to all over the world, mostly, of course, in English-speaking places, but uh, in lots of places, which feels great. I love the fact that I've got that kind of reach, and I try to bring up international stories where I can and try not to be, uh, you know, so focused on the United States. Because I've got listeners, I mean, according to the stats, I've got listeners in, you know, in the UK and Canada, Australia, Germany, Spain, Sweden, Netherlands, France, Poland. Uh, it really is amazing and wonderful. I'm so, so glad that I, to know that I've got an audience outside the U.S. Now, I do this once a year, but you can send me feedback at any time. You can just send an email to feedback at firewallsdon'tstopdragons.com. I will read those if you send them, that, send them my way. Uh, but I'll keep doing this annual listener survey uh, as a formal way to request your feedback. So again, thank you to everybody who responded. I read all your responses, and I'm already acting on them. Real quick, next week, uh, we're going to be talking about open source software. Uh, so for those of you that asked for it, it's coming next week. And uh, it's hard to find a better person to talk to about that than Sean O'Brien. He was on the show a while back, and I'm really glad to finally get him back on the show, and we'll be talking about that next week. Next week, I'm doing some interviews with two really interesting people about a really interesting uh, Microsoft computer security initiative, as well as talking to somebody about cell phone security in particular. And so those interviews should happen next week, which means I'll be spreading those out over the next few weeks when the interview shows come up. So that's what's on the horizon in terms of interviews. And one more reminder that I haven't brought up for a little while, uh, I do give seminars on privacy and security. Uh, I've got a nice little one-hour-ish presentation that I give over Zoom. Uh, if you're curious, if you've got a small private group that might be interested in that, look on my website and go to the contact. There's a, uh, a speaker request form you can fill out there. Um, but I do enjoy doing it. And uh, during COVID, especially with Zoom, I think we're all kind of used to <laughs> consuming information that way. So if you've got a small group, I'd say maybe at least 10 people or you know maybe 20. Let me know if you'd like me to do a little seminar. Again, just do the speaker request form. All right, everybody, that's it for this week. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, subscribe if you haven't. Give the podcast or the book a nice review if you think about it. And until next week, everybody, stay safe out there. And as always, don't get caught with your drawbridge down. <laughs>